Good morning, everybody. All right, on behalf of the commanding officer, uh, I want to welcome you here this morning. Uh, you're here for the purpose of attending the, the fall operational pause. Uh, this is mandated by the commanding general of Marine Corps Installations East. We've got uh, a few PowerPoints for you this morning. Uh, all of this stuff is, uh, is required stuff. It's good stuff. And uh, it's to increase your knowledge about safety and about other uh, programs aboard the installation that are required to, uh, to take care of. So uh, please give you the, the speakers your undivided attention. Trey, you're up. Wow, they're way back. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I'm Trey Daughtery. I'm the U.S. Conservation Officer here at Marine Corps Air Station. I also handle Laurel Bay. Um, I am the Natural Resource Specialist as well. I do all the land management, uh, wildlife management, forestry, uh, stuff like that on base. Um, before we do this, hunting season in South Carolina is open for any hunters out there. Uh, we do hunt on the air station. Uh, if you would like to hunt on the air station, pay attention to my phone number. Give me a call. Can't hear you back here, Greg. Give you the pay attention to my phone number. Give me a call. Uh, you have to go through a safety brief, and uh, it is mandatory every year. Not everybody out there is a hunter. We realize that but hopefully you'll be able to get something from this presentation that uh, jogs your mind and you can use to be more safe. The four main causes of hunting incidents in the United States, uh, these come from the International Hunters Education Association, so I'm not just pulling them out of thin air. The first one is hunter judgment mistakes. Uh, this is the top one, people just not using good judgment, uh, such as not knowing what's in front of or what's behind your target before you take a shot. Uh, another one is going through water in an ATV that's too deep. You know, hey, get out and check the water before you cross it. Uh, another one is not packing enough clothing for a weekend trip. Just judgment mistakes that can be prevented. The second one's gonna be safety rule violations. Ignoring safety rules. Uh, if there's rules in place to be safe, follow them. You won't have any incidents. Lack of control and practice. I was talking to the Marines yesterday. We've all seen them out there around the barrel. They practice plenty before they go to the range. They go to the range every year. Practice makes perfect, right? Not necessarily perfect, but the more you practice, the more control you have, the less mistakes you're gonna have, and the less incidents. Mechanical failure. You're not gonna be able to control mechanical failure all the time. Sometimes it just breaks, all right? But if you're talking about firearms, you can control it by making sure it's clean, making sure your barrel's not obstructed. Firearm safety, you know, with the Marines, they use firearms all the time, PMO. Uh, we, we use firearms all the time, but there's things that happen when you do something over and over and over. You get complacent. Uh, when I was a wildlife biologist here, I was using firearms almost on a daily basis. I saw it, I saw it in myself. You get complacent, you don't need to get complacent. Uh, everybody out there that uses firearms, You've seen these before. I want to put these up there just as a reminder. You know, we cannot be too safe. The first one, always keep the muzzle pointed in a safe direction. If it's always in a safe direction and it goes off, hey, no harm, no foul. You might get in a little trouble depending on where you are, but nobody's going to get injured. Treat every firearm as if it's loaded. Know your target and, again, what is beyond it. Pay attention to what's beyond it. Think about it before you take the shot. Keep your finger off the trigger until you're ready to shoot. Tree stand for any deer hunters. Uh, make sure you purchase a stand that passes TMA standards. Uh, Tree Stand Manufacturers Association. Don't try to go out and make your own deer stand and climb up in it. Uh, a lot of them are very unsafe. If you're hunting a property and you see a tree stand already there, you don't know what kind of condition it's in. Don't climb up in it. Uh, know how the stand works put it up and put it on a tree in your backyard uh, they're pretty simple a few nuts and bolts they're mechanical uh, just make sure you know how it works before you utilize it 
Always use a fall arrest system. That's going to be your harness, your safety harness. Uh, they used to make ones that just go around your waist and soon found out that if you fall with one of those, you're going to break your back immediately. Uh, don't use one of those. Don't use just a shoulder harness. Uh, they found that that cuts off circulation and you will die. Use the full arrest system uh, with the leg pieces and the shoulder pieces. If you're using a climbing stand, don't climb with anything in your hands. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts when you're trying to do that. Uh, you need your hands free and clear so you can hold on. Leave your stuff on the ground, tie a rope to it, pull it up at the end. With that being said, make sure your firearm's unloaded. When you start pulling it up, that barrel's pointed straight towards you. You don't want that. Uh, when you get up there, um, you can load your firearm, but before getting up in the stand, make sure it's unloaded. Because if it does fall, it's nine times out of ten going to fall stock first. All right. The last one, don't sleep in the tree stand. Um, it happens more often than not. You know, you wake up early in the morning to go hunting, that sun starts shining on you, you get all warm and fuzzy, close your eyes and you fall out of tree stand. Not a good thing. Stay awake. Boat safety, this is just a tip. This is, this is very brief. I give a whole class on boating safety. Uh, DNR and I think the Buford Rescue Squadron offer boating safety classes. Anyway, before you go hunting in a boat, duck season's coming up, it's going to be cold, make sure somebody knows where you're going, what boat landing you're going to, who you're going to be with, what time you're coming home. Have a hunting plan and stick to it. Make sure you have life jackets in the boat for everybody. That's not just a recommendation, that's a state law. If you are in a boat, warm weather, cool weather, it doesn't matter, you have to have a Coast Guard approved life jacket for everybody. No alcohol. Uh, in the state of South Carolina, you can get a boating under the influence, boating while intoxicated, uh, not a good idea. Also, when it's cold weather, uh, alcohol increases your chances of getting hypothermia. So no alcohol while you're duck hunting. Make sure your gun's unloaded in a case. I know several, uh, Times dogs have knocked guns overboard, but we would hate for a dog to get his paw in the trigger and the gun go off. Make sure it's unloaded in a case. Prepare for cold water emergencies. You might not have to use the equipment, but you want to have it on board. ATV safety, same thing. We could give a whole nother class on this. Uh, this is just a tip. Maintain a safe speed. Make sure you're going a proper speed for the terrain you're in. If you're going over sand, rocks, going through water, it doesn't matter. Make sure you're going to safe speed. Again, firearm unloaded and preferably in a case. Uh, if not, they make scabbards. You can put them in, strap it to the back rack. Don't lay it across your lap. Um, you don't want it to go off while you're driving. Safety gear, helmet, goggles, gloves, long sleeves, long pants, and boots. Make sure you have that on uh, to be safe. And again, no alcohol. Alcohol and ATVs, you can look up uh, YouTube videos all day of people wrecking their ATVs. All right, it's not a good idea. Don't do it. Any questions? Thank you. Can you hear me with this? Hello? Can you hear me? Oh, there it goes. All right, my name is Chris Dosher. I don't like this. Can y'all hear me without it? No. Okay. My name is Chris Dozier. I'm from the Nero office, the environmental office, and we're here to give you a little environmental brief. Basically, we're going to find out what the EMS is, why we have EMS. Um, again, we're here for the all hands environmental brief and go over the CO's policy. If you don't know it, you should have it posted in your section somewhere. I send out an email twice a year. Um, so that's getting ready to come out probably by the end of the week or next week. And um, the do's and don'ts for our environmental around the base and our points of contacts. So what is EMS? We had EMS, well, why do we have EMS? It's because the Marine Corps says we need to. Back in 2004, they said uh, 
we'll have a fully implemented EMS by 2007. So we've been working on that ever since. Well, it's been fully implemented, but it's, we're working on it. And our required, required order is Marine Corps Order 5090.2 Alpha. EMS establishes a standard of framework to basically go over your practices and eliminate or minimize the risk to the mission and adverse impacts. It's a continual improvement. It's not a once and done type program. We're working on it every year. Um, and that includes the environmental awareness. So we'll go over the CO's policy and a lot of units, I don't know how many coordinators we have for civilians, but uh, environmental coordinators are a very important part of the aspect here. So, um, each month they have a environmental coordinator meeting normally held the last Thursday of the month over at Afterburners. So if you have an environmental coordinator, make, coordinator, make sure that they're going to that meeting. The commanding officer's policy, so, Marine Corps Air Station Buford is committed to responsible stewardship of resources and the environment. So he breaks it down into professionalism. So obviously we're going to try and conserve our natural and cultural resources, remediate the prior DOD practices of just throwing stuff away and burying it, uh, minimize our risk to the mission through our continual improvement of EMS. What do we want to do for the standards? To integrate pollution prevention principles, you know, a lot of recycling, make sure you're throwing your uh, plastic bottles in the right receptacles, make sure that your cardboard is put away properly, not in the dumpsters, and you know, we're doing things correctly, putting things away. We're not dumping our uh, cleaning supplies and everything down the storm drains, make sure they go down into the deep sinks where they need to go. We don't want just every soap and kind of chemical running down into the storm drain because obviously we live in the low country and everything just drains out to the river or you know if it doesn't get to a treatment plant you know if you spill it you know our ecology uh, waterways and all around here are very important and very sensitive uh, communication we want to make sure and that's what we're doing now that everybody has a good understanding of what the environmental awareness is on base so make sure we want to Managing uh, chemical weapons, or, I'm sorry, chemical weapons, chemical and hazardous materials. Participate in the base hazmat program. Uh, again, I mentioned the Joint Hazmat Center. That's our monthly meeting over at Afterburners. And P2. No matter how small the spill is, make sure you report your spills to Nero if it goes down a storm drain. So just. Give them a call and say, hey, we had this go down the storm drain. We want you to be aware of it. Somebody will come and check it out and make sure that um, we don't have to, you know, it's a reportable spill or anything like that. If you have an emergency, call 911 after, for after hours. All your hazardous waste. Um, we probably have maintenance people in here to, that need to dispose of things over at Nero, over at the recycle center. So make sure we're turning that in properly. We're not just you know, getting a drum of something or you know, a battery or whatever and just throw it in the trash. All that stuff has to be disposed of properly. All right, just some housekeeping type things. Your dumpsters, you know, dumpsters are a problem around here where people are just throwing whatever they want in it. No recyclables, you know, keep them closed, things like that. Um, don't throw any paints or chemicals in there. And, you know, I used to live around a cul-de-sac and we had uh, a neighbor that broke the lid on their trash can. So half of it was water. When they dumped the trash can, we had these big puddles that went all the way around the cul-de-sac and left a trail. So everybody's trash from the trash truck that picked up previously, you know, we had that all around, around the road. You know, we had kids playing in it and you know, it's just nasty. You don't know what was in there. You know, you see oil sheen or whatever on the road when it comes up. So, you know, that's a big reason you want to keep them closed. It's one thing is not getting full of water and you're transferring all that fluid 
wherever the trash truck goes. All right, just make sure we do what we're supposed to be doing. We obey all posted and work center environmental SOPs. That's our ESOPs. Uh, contact your coordinators. Contact myself at 6047 if you have any questions. Uh, you should have posters out there for environmental awareness. It has the CO's policy on it. Uh, this is more for the Marines. You know, make sure you're using the hobby shop. Obviously, you know, I don't know who can use that civilian-wise, but um, you know, we don't want any maintenance being done in parking lots and changing oil and things like that. And call our CTEP coordinator if uh, you need any type of training at 7884. I just went over this, went over that. So I'm ahead of the game. All right, here's our point of contact. I know everybody has a pen and paper. If you don't, go ahead and look in the phone book if you need a phone number. Here's a few things we don't want to see. You know, if your vehicle breaks down, don't put it by the dumpsters. You know, that's uh, obviously you know, non-mechanical person right there. They couldn't fix it, so we don't want to. Our trash guy will not get out and pick that up. You know, that's that's going. It should have been no telling where it came from, but it was in the barracks. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, don't mix your waste. You know, if you have a waste stream at work and it says, do not put trash in here, don't put trash in there. Because somebody else has to go through that and pick your stuff out, you know? It's just uncourteous for one. But, you know, when Nero gets a hold of it, they have to look at it and say, what's going on? Why, we are, why are we not following our procedures? If you have any e-waste, Make sure you contact the correct people, contact S6, IT, help desk, uh, find out what you need to do with it, but it goes to Dermo, so you know, we just need to make sure if you have hard drives and things like that, make sure you're contact contacting S6. If you have old printers and things, then we need to contact Dermo. You know, general housekeeping, you know, if you see something that doesn't look right, either say something or clean it up yourself, you know. Um, we shouldn't see things like this where it's just a mess, you know. Uh, another example of filters and things like that, you know, just kind of strewn around the place. And some of these are air filters, some of these are oil filters. So if you have it draining on the floor, where's it going? Down to the storm drain, you know. All right, do I have any questions? All right, thank you for your time. Good morning, everybody. My name is Adam Gray. I work in the safety office. And I'm going to talk in a loud, booming voice so everybody can hear me. Everybody good? All right, we're going to talk about driving awareness. All right, some of you have teenagers, do you not? Am I the only one that has teenagers? All right. But before that, on an average, 95 people die every day in automobile mishaps. Is that too many? Yes. But if 100 people die in a plane crash, everybody loses their mind, right? But 95 people, it's a common thing. We just don't even think twice about it. But has an automobile accident ever affected any of you? Family members, friends of family members. Oh yeah, even if they survive, it does affect them, does it not? All right. So in 2016, because this is the current stat, uh, statistics, 37,000 people died in automobile mishaps. Is that a lot of people? Oh, yes. That's about the city of Beaufort. I mean, that's, that's a lot of people. All right. Texting and driving. 
This is a big thing with the, the newer generation because they grew up with phones, right? All right? Because sending that text while they're driving is the most important thing they do at that moment, is it not? Because they will not live another 10 seconds unless they get that text out. But does it take a lot of skill to drive an automobile? Do we take it for granted sometimes when we've been driving for 30 years? Are there bad drivers here in Beaufort? I got news for you. The entire United States is full of bad drivers. Most of us have little or no driving training when we got our driver's license when we were 16. Did anybody get formal 40 hours of driving training before they got their driver's license? Very few, okay. Not a lot of people get that. Some states do it, some states don't. But that's why we have so many bad drivers. All right, texting gives you 35% chance more of having a mishap. All right, and on the average, 10 teens die every day in the United States while texting. Not just bad driving, just texting. And it doesn't take that long to lose control, to not pay attention. On an average, it's four and a half seconds, about the length of a football field, because they look down at their phone, and all of a sudden, something happens in front of them, and they don't know how to react properly to it. Is four seconds a lot of time? It's a blink in your life, but that's enough to change everything forever, is it not? All right. Try to eliminate distracted driving. Use hands-free device. A lot of new modern automobiles and trucks nowadays have all that hands-free. You pair your phone to it. All you have to do is push a button on your steering wheel and you can answer your email or answer your phone call for some of us, right? Some of us still drive the old classics, all right? How many people use their phone to GPS when they're traveling? It does help, does it not? All right, secure your pets and loose gear. I was talking to the Marines yesterday. There was a Marine who had a mishap, rolled his vehicle, had his seatbelt on, but because of the loose gear in the back of his car, hit him in the head and killed him. All right, so secure your gear in your car and your pets and your kids. I forgot kids, I should have added that. All right. All right, try not to smoke, eat, or play music too loud. Try not to be distracted when you ride, drive. All right, seat belts. How many people wear seat belts? I hope all of you wear your seat belts. I'd rather have that scar on my shoulder than in the intensive care with a tube up my nose and half my brain gone because I didn't wear my seatbelt and I hit my head on the steering wheel. All right, and I have some stats there when I was talking to the Marines. Last year we lost 12 Marines to uh, POV deaths. Three of them were not wearing their seatbelts. They'd probably be here today if they were wearing their seatbelts. Seatbelts do work. All right, you all know that we have uh, License plate readers coming into this gate, coming to our base. They check your tags. They let PMO know if your tags are expired and also your insurance. Oh yeah, they will pull you over. Big brother is watching. All right. But I see it every day. As soon as I leave base, I make that left turn to go home. And what do I see everybody do? Bring their phone up. All right, so don't let your last text be a, become your last words, okay? Wait till you get home, pull over, or hands-free. All right, the last thing we're going to cover is some off-duty rec. Hazards in the fall season. Everybody likes a good campfire in the fall when it gets cool, correct? How about turkey fryers? Frying a turkey for Thanksgiving. And we're going to talk about UTV training, all right? Fires. How many people like to have a fire in the fall when it's cool out? It's a lot of fun. Nice and cool. Fire works great. Have some friends over. All right. But do you build a fire five feet from your house like my neighbor did and wonder why his vinyl siding melted? I wasn't there. I saw the aftermath. All right. Do not build in windy conditions 15 feet away from Flammable materials. Check the area around where you're having a fire. All right. 
Rule number three, if you don't know how to build a fire, maybe you should build one. And pouring a bunch of gasoline on a couple of pieces of wood is not how you make a fire. Ask a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout. They'll tell you how to make a fire properly, the correct way. And the last thing, the most important part, is if you have a fire, what should you do with that fire when you're done? Put it out. Even if it's a little trickle of smoke, put it out. Can, that, can the wind cause that to flare up and cause another fire? Ask California how that, that works. Turkey fryers. How many people have had fried turkey for Thanksgiving or any other holiday? Is it good? It's awesome. Try a deep fried ham. Oh my God, that's good. Oh yes. All right, but you're cooking with hot grease. Is there a hazard with that besides getting burned? All right. I've seen a lot of people, they fill that, they fill the bucket up with grease all the way to the top and then they stick the turkey in it. And if you remember from science, two things cannot occupy the same space. So all that oil goes out and it runs by the flame and catches fire. And if you're inside the house, what happens? You have that. Don't put it outside on the wooden deck either. Put it outside in a non-flammable area, like on concrete, a driveway. All right? Keep the kids away, the dogs, because the dogs love to come up and smell it, don't they? All right? Don't, if you have grandkids running around, keep them away from it. A festive holiday turns into an emergency room visit, sucks the life out of everything. All right? If your guests have been drinking, should you keep them away from it? Holidays are stressful for some people. Some people, that's how they handle stress. They have a few drinks. Keep them away. If they trip and fall on that, bad things happen. And rule number four, as the cook, should you be sober? Keep people away. Yes. The nice thing about a, tur a turkey fryer is you can cook a turkey in less than an hour. It does work very well. And the last thing I'm going to talk about, UTV and ATV safety. Mostly I'm going to talk about UTVs, the bottom picture there. The side-by-side, -side, four by fours. Does anybody have one of these at home? Nobody? Okay. We got some on base though, but they are a lot of fun. Especially you get the high performance ones where you can jump hills and all that other good stuff. But you put passengers in the back of that. Throw the kids in the back and just go run through the woods with it. Hit a bump and you're like, where'd the kids go, right? If there's a spot for a passenger, that's where you put them. You seat belt them in. They have their proper PPE. They got a helmet, eye protection, so they don't get thrown out. So you don't have any more oopses. All right. We do have a training range on base. It's being occupied by a construction company right now. Hopefully, in the future, we can get it back to uh, teaching the course. Are there any questions on anything I've covered? No, do not fry a frozen turkey. That is the worst. It will explode. Always have the turkey defrosted at room temperature. All right. Who's next? Who was supposed to wear this yesterday and today? It's for her up there. It's not an actual microphone. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, for those of you that do not know me, my name is Craig Kovacs. I'm also with the safety office. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. I'm not used to using one of these. I have a uh, voice that usually can carry, so I'll try to speak softly with this. First classes, uh, first thing that we're going to cover is the mandatory classes that are provided through our safety office for you guys, for all employees. How many people here have attended a 10 hour course? Good, good. What about a 30 hour? Okay, do you recommend them to your friends? Okay, good. Means we're doing something right. This is the order of classes that are mandatory through the Air Station Order 5100.24 Delta. 
Uh, these are requirements that through the air station order we said all civilian employees will attend. The order states for the 10 hour that we attend that within at least one year. Everybody knows what VPP is, right? If you don't, you're gonna get a class on it right after this by me, so we'll get through that one as well. But through our VPP initiatives, we stated within 90 days of employment, all new civilian employees should attain the 10 hour. That's why we offer it four times a year. Um, the, it's a two day course. Usually we do it thanks to cooperation with MCCS on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, so not to interfere with family days or graduation days on Paris Island. Um, simple class, two days. We offer it four times a year. Um, we have done specialty training, as in we've taken it down to towns and bombing range uh, to teach the gentlemen down there because they couldn't make it up here to a class. So we are accommodating with it. If you have issues for some reason trying to get new employees in, just give myself or Adam a call. We'll get you in the class. 30 hour OSHA class. Again, the air station order, 24 Delta states that all safety representatives must attend the 30 hour in order to be designated as a safety representative for your section. Our VPP initiative also highly encourages all supervisors to take the same training. We offer this class twice a year, usually up to three times, but we also do it on Wednesdays so that most supervisors and safety reps can't afford to take four days off in a row. Your workshops and centers would go nuts if you were gone for four days in a row. So we offer it on Wednesdays, one day a week. The only exception to that is in November, the week of Thanksgiving, we offer it on a Tuesday. So not to mess with anybody's Thanksgiving week. Okay, this class is mandatory if you're going to be a safety representative. In other words, if you're gonna be the one that's in charge when we come around doing our safety inspections, i.e. if you're MCCS, you're gonna see me. If you're a safety rep, you're the person I'm coming to initially or the supervisor to make sure that all your safety requirements are done. If you have any questions or concerns, again, give me a call. Does everybody know how to sign up for these classes? What's my four little favorite word letters? ESAMs. You must sign up through ESAMs. This way we have a record track of you attending the courses. Okay, it goes all the way back to 2011. So if you've taken an OSHA class aboard the air station here, all the way back to 2011, I can tell you exactly when you took it and what your OSHA card number is. Because we have those on file. Safety orientation for supervisors. This is another required class through the air station order. What we, how we offer this class is twice a year. It's an in-classroom class for your first time taking the course. Takes Adam and I about six, six and a half hours to do it. From there, it's also an annual requirement that you do it within ESAMs every year. And that's also posted in the air station order. Okay, so you take it once with us in class and we don't, we, most of the super, uh, supervisors have been here long enough that they've either taken it through that course or they just take it online through ESAMS. If you take it through ESAMS, it does about a half hour. Um, if you have questions or problems getting into it, it's on the, the web training on ESAMS and the class number is 1077. So that's fairly simple. Any questions on this one? Again, this is trackable, so when management wants to know who's taken a supervisor safety orientation course, it takes me about two and a half minutes on a bad day to pull it up with an ESAMS and find out exactly who's taken it throughout the whole air station. Okay, that covers that. Next class usually would be done by Ron, but he's at the CEO's meeting this morning, so we're gonna cover this one. As you can tell by your watches, we're breezing through these pretty easy, because after me, you only got one more. Yeah, you all liked that, didn't you? Okay, good. VPP, who's heard of it? I should see about 90% of the hands go up. 
Come on, you all know what it is. You've seen it, you've been around it. If you've been on this air station for more than a year, you should know what VPP is. Guess what we're coming up on? Recertification. Everybody understand what that means? When we've got our voluntary protection program established two and a half years ago, that was seven years in the making to get to that point. Since then, now it's gearing up towards what? Recertification every three years. So June of 2019 is when we're qualified to be reinspected. So our goal is to make sure that everybody understands. We go back through the whole process during your BITS training, I believe, which will go in January or February. You're going to see the video again, Mr. Del Tingley doing his interview process. Everybody remember that video that he did? Okay, you'll get that again. We'll start really gearing up, ramping up. By a show of hands, how many people here have seen Colonel Miller within the work centers? Good. That's a, that's a decent amount of hands. Okay. Why is that important? Somebody. Bueller, Bueller. Why is it important for the the CEO of the base to walk through his work centers. To show that he's involved, exactly. In 1982, the OSHA developed VPP to recognize and promote effective work site-based safety and health management system. That's when VPP initially started. We started aboard the air station in 2009. That's when we started our VPP initiative. What does VPP do? VPP compares your safety and health management system to key elements found in the best safety and health management systems worldwide, more particularly American companies. Okay, there are some internationals that also work with VPP. Benefits of a voluntary protection program, improved safety and health for workers, average injury illness rates of VPP star sites are 52% below those of the industry peers. I can tell you we're below even that. Okay, our industry numbers, our DART and TISA rates, if you've ever heard those before, are severely lower than that. So we're doing a really good job of that. Cost savings, lost time and property, disruption to lost productivity, medical treatment, workers' compensation. These are all interconnected from a workman's compensation cost. The lower amounts that we are giving out means more money for the installation because that money comes right off the top of the list. And of course, it improves morale and productivity. Keys to VPP success. Look at your safety and health in a different way. It's not a program. It is a way of life. It's a core value. It's not just meeting requirements. It's eliminating hazards. I've had to explain this over the years, not just to myself initially, to kind of understand what the program was designed to do, but especially to those of us that have a military mindset of, it's a program, there's gotta be a check in the block that we can do to cover this program, to make sure we hit all the wickets. That is not VPP by any stretch. Okay, yes, there are certain things that are minimum requirements, but the whole idea of VPP and its initiative is to get you to understand that you always wanna try and take your safety program one step farther. Take it that extra step and say, okay, yep, we're meeting everything, how can I make it better? How can I make it safer for my employees? That's what VPP is designed to do. We don't do it until we can do it safely. And VPP is a process, a culture, not an inspection. That's part of the reason why it took us seven years from the start in 2009 to achieve VPP star status. Because we had to get into everybody's mind and thought process this is not a program. It's not just another CGRI checklist that we have to go through, okay? You have to feed this and implement it. And there are ways that we go about doing that. Here are your four main elements. I'm sure all of you have seen this before, right? How many of you have been beaten over the head with these? A few of you, good. Management leadership and employee involvement. This is the reason why I asked the question about Colonel Miller. Because if Colonel Miller is taking the time out of his busy schedule to come through and look in through your work sites 
and talk to employees, that should tell you that your leadership and your management, they care, okay? Employee involvement is getting you involved in your safety program. How many people here have actually gone on a safety walk within their work centers? Okay, I got a, a decent amount of you. That's important because whether you're the safety rep or not, an extra set of eyes doing the safety walk allows you a different understanding and perspective of what safety means to your work center. How does it keep the rest of the employees safe? Okay, worksite analysis. What are the other three favorite word letters of mine? Start with a J. J H A. This is where you get your worksite analysis from. Can you effectively do your job if you don't know what the safety hazards are? You can do your job, but it may not be done correctly or it may not be done safely. And that's what a worksite analysis does for you. It defines all the things that can possibly get you injured and hurt and make sure that you can do your job correctly knowing those hazards. Then you get into hazard prevention and control. This is again where you find out what those hazards are. How do I eliminate those hazards? How do I put in certain types of restrictions or compliance notes that say, hey, if you're going to do this job, you're going to do it this way. We're going to give you administrative controls. We're going to set up your SOPs and, and turnover folders to make sure that if you're going to do this job, you do it safely and in the manner that we tell you to do it in to keep you safe. And then obviously your last level of control is what? PPE. So from a PPE perspective, we want to make sure that you have not only the right PPE, but PPE that's going to help keep you safe so that you get to go home with all 10 fingers and 10 toes. And then of course, safety and health training. You get a new piece of equipment in your work center. What do we do? What should we do, I should say? Men, we're pretty bad about what? Reading instructions? We don't want to read those. They're not for us. Maybe take five minutes, go through it, find out what all the safety precautions are. This is part of the training. Make sure everybody else in your work center before they use that piece of equipment is trained on it to know exactly how to properly use it. Okay. The next class that you get is on risk management through Dell and he's going to cover some of those things much along those lines of what that is. And then the classes that we offer, the 10 hour, the 30 hour, the supervisor's orientation safety course. Okay. All these classes, they're designed to do what? Give you a little bit more knowledge. Make you be able to go back to your work centers and say, hey, I never noticed this before, but because of the class I just took, hey, this could be a safety concern. Okay, that's the idea behind it. So, 2018 VPP goals. Anybody seen these around the air station? Some of you still have 2016s up. We've seen those around. As a matter of fact, they were in this building. I pulled them down yesterday. So our number one goal is to develop and implement the MCAS Beaufort Safety Smartphone app. We have seen this developed and we're working with Quantico up in Virginia. They have an actual app for your smartphones. It's not just safety oriented stuff. Destructive weather is going to be on there. Okay. If you see something that looks like it's broken or could become a safety hazard, all of us carry a smartphone or most of us carry a smartphone. Take a picture of it, send it to our office. I've had regular Marines do that. Send me pictures of a light pole that's missing a cover on it. Within 48 hours, we usually can have that fixed so that nothing happens. Uh, there's a whole litany of stuff. Adam's working on the app as we speak uh, to make sure that we have it and that'll be passed out to you guys. That's an initiative from us. To establish a safety program compliance report by divisions Creating a report card for the commanding officer. This is going to be done through ESAMS so that we can tell. Can you all hear me? Because that's got to be better than that feedback coming from that thing. When we talk about creating a report card for the CO, it's going to be broken down by sections. And within here, it's going to tell us what you're doing right and what you're doing wrong from a safety perspective. Are you doing your 
monthly safety inspections? Are you having your monthly safety talks? All these checks that go in there so the commanding officer can see which sections are doing what they're supposed to do. Okay, it's just a quick way for them to look at it and then they can hit your supervisor and say, hey, what's going on here? You're missing some things. Okay, it's accountability piece. Number three, all safety representatives will complete and report to the safety department their monthly safety inspection reports every 30 days and we're looking for at least 80% of that. So if you're within MCCS, what do I require from you guys if you're the safety rep? I want that report once a month saying that you've done your safety inspection report, right? This is going to go out through everybody now. Okay, this is one of our other initiatives here. So I can get that report and I can see your monthly reports. I can look at it and say, hey, this section is doing a great job with this. This section's missing one here or there. Because I get it, people go on leave, other people are out of work for whatever reason, you may accidentally not get to it till later, or you're doing it, but you don't send it to me. Okay, that's why we require 80% of the time. And then number four is to establish an electronic means for new employee check-ins, utilizing their job safety training worksheet, initial supervisor safety training, and assignment to a safety training class. We're trying to make this easier for supervisors when you have new check-ins and they come see us and we give them an eSAMS account and then we look out how far out do I have a 10 hour can I get this individual set up to be in that class so that it doesn't get lost in the weeds because what happens when you go back to your work section you tend to forget about all this training that's required and then supervisors get wrapped up and then next thing you know Somebody hasn't attained a training and they're past a 90 day window. Or if you have a section that has a high turnover rate, I may come in and do an inspection on your area and find out that 70% of your employees do not have a 10 hour training. It's because most of them have been hired within the last six months. That's kind of hard to do. So what we're looking here is to get you set up so hey we'll get you set up for the class we'll send the supervisors reminders so that these people can receive the training because when's the chance of you actually getting hurt the most at your work center within the first six months or if you've been doing the job over nine years that's what the stats tell us so that's why we're trying to eliminate the initial and get you into your training Okay, again, we are a VPP star site. We have visited, most of us in the safety office, other bases that are star sites that are going through recertifications. And the number one thing they will tell us is it's harder to maintain a VPP star status than it is to achieve it, even though it took us seven years, because now you have to stay at that level. So that's what we're going to be working towards for the next year, year and a half. Any questions? Okay. Do we have Dell anywhere? Okay. Maybe I'm going through this one too. Get you out of here even quicker. Can you all still hear me in the back? Okay. So we'll keep that out. Personal risk management. Who can tell me a good reason for why we're doing this training? Other than it's a requirement for annual training. Say again? Lower mishaps. It's to reduce the level of risk within mishaps. That's what we're looking for. Okay. Sorry, it's a new clicker and it's very touchy. Who here has seen one of these before? Good, a bunch of you. This is what we call a risk management tool. Operational risk management worksheet. All we're looking at here, this is kind of the old way of doing things. Hey, you put everything down on paper, you try to minimize the risks. What are we looking for instead? That, everybody got one of these, right? Some of you. Okay, so for those that do, this is what you want to use. It's called common sense. If you've got a brain, you can figure out from a risk management, hey, should I do this? If I do this, how bad can I get hurt? If I can get hurt, 
Am I going to the hospital hurt or am I going to the morgue hurt? Okay, it's assessing the risk levels that you're dealing with, finding out should this be done the way that we're looking at doing it or should we apply some mitigating risks, factors into it, try to reduce that. There are five steps. You've all seen these before. Identify the hazard, assess the hazard, make risk decisions, implement controls, and to supervise. We're going to kind of go through all of these a little bit. That would be a hazard, would it not? Ladder in water using electrical tools. But hey, he was thinking a little bit because what has he got on his eyes? He's got goggles on. Okay? But a hazard is a condition with the potential to cause personal injury, death, or property damage. Here's your risk. It's an expression of possible loss in terms of probability and severity. The guy holding the ankles looks a little distracted, does he not? What if he slips? How bad, in possible terms of loss, is it going to be for that individual that's leaning over the edge? That could hurt, could it not? Could it kill him? Depends on how high up they are. But this is your level of risk. The probability is the likelihood that a hazard will result in a mishap or loss. Okay, admit it, we've all done stupid things at one point or another. How many times have you actually said, wow, that could be bad? Okay, that's what we call that near miss. What are the chances here that he accidentally hits one of these wooden boards and this truck is going to bend him like a pretzel? Okay, this is where the issue is. May not happen the first time he does this, may not happen the second. Sooner or later, it's going to happen, right? So what is the probability that he can get severely injured? Could that be the worst consequence? Okay. If your chances of dying while you're doing something, that's about as high a severity level as you're going to get, right? If I'm only going to cut my finger or twist my ankle, that's not as severe as if I'm going to end up in one of these. Okay, we all end up in one of these, but sometimes sooner rather than later. Controls is a method for reducing risk for an identified hazard by lowering the probability of occurrence, decreasing potential severity, or both. What is this young man doing? He's tech welding, okay? Does he have a PPE on? Absolutely. Does he have the right levels of PPE on? The other issue with this that you look at is he realizes that the arcs coming off from where he's welding had the possibility to burn his face, right? Get a little shot put on him. So he puts the paper up there. He's got safety goggles on. He's got a hat on his head, make sure his hair doesn't burn. He's got pretty thick gloves on. What is he forgetting about? Sooner or later, those hot tick um, flames coming off there are gonna catch that paper on fire. Now what do you got? Now your face is going to be on fire, okay? So this is your levels of control. He's got some of it, but maybe not necessarily the ones that are most important to him, okay? So this is where the issue comes in. So using those controls that we just went over, those probability levels, those severity levels, the risk levels, applying all of those together, let's go through this one. You heard a little bit already today about campfires, right? What's the main concern with campfires? Causing other fires, what else? 
What does a fire do? Burns things, right? Do you want to get burned? I would think that's your number one first concern, right? Let's make sure we don't burn anybody. So if we go through this, what are some of the precautions that we can take? Don't build a big one, one that gets out of control. What else? Make sure the area around it is adequate to have a fire. Don't have a fire in a wooded area where it's covered over the top and then build up flames too large that's going to catch everything else on fire, right? We had an incident a couple of years ago, Marines, of course, taking used paint cans. Guess what they did with them? Threw them in the fire. Guess what happened? They exploded. Next thing that happened is we sent a couple of Marines to the hospital with some burns. These are all precautions. So if I'm going to build a campfire, how do I want to go about doing this? First off, I want to make sure I know how to build the fire. I know how to build a fire safely. What precautions am I going to put in place? What control levels or am I going to put in to make sure that nobody gets burned? so that I don't catch a forest on fire. Okay, these are all the things that you need to look at. How do we minimize those using risk mitigation? That's what we're looking to do. Make sense? What about this? What are we doing here? So if I want to make that fire, what do I got to have? Firewood. How do I go about getting firewood? Maybe one of these two different ways of doing it. What are the issues here? How much experience do you have using a chainsaw? Who here has never used a chainsaw before? Okay. Are you just going to jump out there, grab one, go rent one from Lowe's or Home Depot, go out and start cutting down that 10-foot tree in your backyard? Yeah. People have been known to do it. Trust me. I'm one of them. Okay. Maybe you should either A, Get somebody that knows what they're doing, or at least have somebody around you that can train you on what? The proper use of a chainsaw. What are the concerns that we have with a chainsaw? Cutting yourself. Cutting yourself. What else? Worried about all this stuff flying up in your face? This is why you wear chaps. This is why you wear gloves. This is why you wear some kind of something to protect your eyes. Okay? Also, you've got to know exactly how to use it and cut and angle and everything else. What about the one on the right? Just using nothing but a, an axe. What are we worried about here? Same potential injuries, right? What if I swing and miss and that axe ends up in my toe? Maybe I should have steel toes on? Okay. What if I, I take one of those pieces of wood and I accidentally hit it on a knot, it bounces back up because I didn't use a proper technique? Okay, these are all things that should be thought of before you start using it and then figuring out how do I find ways to mitigate this, to lower the, the reduce the risk that we're going to deal with. Last scenario, ladder use. So I put a ladder up. If you've been through a 10 hour or 30 hour, you know we cover ladders pretty extensively. What's the general rule of thumb? Remember that math question that you had on there? The one most of you hated? That was simple? Not wait. Distance away, the ladder must be. One quarter of the distance. However tall your ladder is going to be, you want that coming out. It's about a one to four ratio, right? So for every four feet a ladder goes up, you want it one foot away from the wall. Okay, if you're going eight feet because you're going to a second story, how far out do you want it? Not four feet, two feet, two feet out. Okay, so you want to make sure you have the correct distance. What is this young lady doing here? She's cleaning out gutters. What are some of the potential hazards that you deal with this? Rats, animals. Okay, what else? Ladder can slide. I get up there, I start clearing things out, but I see that one acorn or that one just out of my reach. What do I start doing? I start reaching for it. 
Is that smart? What can happen to the ladder? You start putting your weight all to one side, you're going to tilt it and lean it. Next thing you know, you're going to end up on the ground. These are all scenarios. So we do these things in our daily lives, right? How do we not hurt ourselves? We look at the scenario that we're in and we say, okay, how can I do this without getting hurt? How can I do this without causing injury to myself or others? That's called risk management. We do it every day. Okay? Look at a situation. Find out how severe, how bad could this be? Hey, if I'm sitting on my roof on a two-story building, what are the chances that I'm going to slip and fall off this when I'm putting Christmas tree lights up? If it's wet out or rainy, do you think I want to be on that roof? Maybe I should have some kind of life harness on? Because I know if I fall off this, I'm going to get hurt pretty bad or possibly break my neck. So you've got to look at all your potential issues, reduce it down to a level of risk that is acceptable for you. Everybody's famous words, right? We got your training done inside an hour. I don't think anybody can complain about that to cover all this stuff. In conclusion, risk management is something that we use every day. You apply it at your work, you apply it when you're at home. This is why it becomes annual training. It's just that quick reminder, hey, this is what we got. Here are your principles. Only accept risk when benefits outweigh the costs. Accept no unnecessary risk. Anticipate and manage risk by planning and make risk decisions at the correct level. Go back to that chainsaw for a second. If you've got teenagers, how many of you are willing to just give that chainsaw to one of your children and say, hey, go cut this tree down? But no training, no nothing. Or if that teenager comes to you and says, hey, I'm going to take the chainsaw and go cut this tree down. Is that a risk decision that they can make? Probably not. Make sure it's done at the correct level. Okay. Just because you're the one going out to do it doesn't mean that you get to be the one that says, yes, it's okay to do it. Make sure it's done at the right levels. And again, anticipation and manage of risk by planning. If you plan out a project nine and a half times out of ten, you're going to be safe with it because you're looking and considering what are all the hazards, what is everything that's going to cause me for this operation to go wrong. Okay? We do it on a regular basis. The bottom line is it's just common sense. Use it. And life is tough, but it's tougher if you're stupid. Mike, that one's for you. Any questions? That is all we have for you.